Hi, y'all. This is Kristen Chenoweth. Hi, I'm Gloria Stefan. This is Sarah Bareilles. Hi, I'm Patty Lapone. This is Lynn Manuel Miranda. You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. There's a cat over here. There's a cat, There's a cat over there. And the wrong one died. And the wrong one died. Welcome to The Wrong Cat Died, the podcast breakdown of the cast catastrophe. I'm your host, Mike Abrams, and today we have another amazing guest. She was Rumple Teaser during the 2022-2023 Asia Tour, which was in Korea and Taiwan. And I'm very excited to have her here. So welcome, Katie Hutton. Thank you for joining me. Hello. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. I know we've talked about this and doing this for a while. So I am finally, I know you've been in a bunch of other shows and you've been doing a bunch of stuff and moving and a lot of like life going on. So I'm glad we finally mm-hmm. found time to sit down and, and chat through because I, your tour was kind of like one of uh, ones that, you know, there's a U.S. tour, there was the international tour, and then there was your tour that kind of all kind of came back. And I've always been fascinated by tours in Korea and Taiwan and Asia because there's such a passion for the show there. And it's such an interesting, like they love it and they always have amazing crowds and this like really great marketing and all kinds of fun stuff. So we'll get to that. But I got to always start, you got to start at the beginning. So I love to hear your cat's history as a dancer, as a, in ballet, did you watch the 1998 movie growing up or what was your first introduction to the show? Of course I did. Every, yeah. everyone has. Um, my mum actually watched the show a long time ago when she was about 10 years old and my parents aren't stagey at all, but it's her favorite show because it's the first one that she saw. So that was my first introduction to cats. And then I saw the show myself when I was 11. It was one of the first shows that I saw as well. And my dance teacher took me to see it, which was really special. And then a couple of years later, I was a bit brave and asked her if I could have the Jellicle Ball as my modern solo. Obviously, you can't have an eight minute modern solo. Yeah. <laughs> and she was like, no, you're not old enough. And I was crushed. I was heartbroken. And then the year after, she made me work for it a little bit. And then she she gave it to me like a cut version of the ball. So I used to, my modern was my favorite dance and I used to do really well in it every year. And I just loved it, it was my favorite. And then I went to college, I went to Bird College for three years to train. And that, Cats always remained one of my top shows to do when I graduated. And during my training, we went into lockdown, obviously the whole world. And I took class with, a lot of ex-cats at the time, yeah. quite a few, and learned parts of the ball and the audition routine ready for when I graduated. I had an audition for the international tour, which went on at the same time, which a couple of my friends ended up doing. I went to college with Maya, who was the white cat on that tour. And I also auditioned for the cruise, but neither of them went my way, but they weren't for Rumpel Teaser. So then when the audition came through, for the Asia tour for Rumpel. It just felt meant to be because she's my favorite. She's always been my favorite. So yeah, that's oh, my so story. Fun. Okay, I've got a couple follow-up questions. So let's start with seeing it at a, as an 11 year old. Was this a West End, a tour? Like where was this first viewing? It was the UK tour. Um, UK tour, okay. Yeah, I think 2014 and it was at Nottingham Theatre Royal, which I am, um, I live in the countryside, so that's our closest theatre, and it's still about an hour away. So other than pantomimes, it was the first thing that I'd seen. And yeah, it introduced me to the idea of this like crazy thing actually being a career. And yeah, I don't remember much about it. I actually really thought Grizabella went up in a spaceship. So it was completely lost on me. Um, And my mum didn't have an answer for it either. So... So that's what I sort of lived with for the next few years until I, I learned about the show properly. But yeah, it was just, it's fascinating. Yeah. Such a cool show to watch. That's, that young. that's, that young is, it makes sense too, because it's a hard show to understand an adult. And it's the, so it's, it makes sense. Okay. So you see it at 11 and then how old are you when you're asking to do the ball as your, like, as your dance, like your solo? <laughs> I first asked for it when I was 14 which is like intermediate level at home at competitions. And I think it was my teacher's plan because she knew I loved the show, but she gave it to me in my first year of senior, which was when I was 15. And then I actually ended up using it for a lot of my recalls for my college auditions. So it's been a part of me for a really a long time. It's so nice to look back on. 
So you have, yeah, so the, the ball, or at least a section of the ball, isn't it like 13 minutes, right? It's like really long. But a section of the ball has been your go-to dance solo audition for most of your life? Yeah, like a two-minute version. But, I, you know, I watched it when I, when I got the show and I, I showed it to my teacher as like the hint to tell her what I was doing. And it just has made it so much more special. And our dances are something that are passed on like to the next generation. So all the, the younger girls that dance now, they have my character and my ballet music and nobody's got the modern yet because I think they're a bit scared to give it. And then obviously the younger girl be like, I'm going to be in Cats now because it does like, yeah, it's one of those pieces of music where once you've done it, it just becomes an aim, a goal in life. So I hope that she passes it on soon and yeah, and that it happens to somebody else because I think it's, I... it's such a dream of the show. I love that. So it's like, this has been, it, so there's like people who I talk to who they fall into it because they're just dancers, singers, or musical theater people. And this is a, a one of hundreds of auditions they're probably doing. And this is the show that, that they book. And then there's your scenario, which <laughs> is, this was like childhood first show, did this throughout all of your life, then dancing leading up through university, through everything. And then you book it. So it, this has got to be like, when you were auditioning, is that audition harder for like, for the uh, Asia tour that you booked? Was that harder or easier? Cause you obviously know parts of it. It's like a show that you love, but also the pressure of, I want this. It's like, this is like my dream show. Like, does that, when you're doing this, like, I'm not in this space. I don't like, I don't, I don't go to any auditions. I don't perform. So I'm just kind of thinking like, is that an easier situation or a more challenging situation? I actually had the, I have the weirdest audition story from, from my cast <laughs> no. experience. It's so different to any of my other auditions. But generally, to answer your question, like as a performer generally, I think it makes it harder because immediately your heart is set mm. on the job. It's, it's planning your life as the cat and seeing your face in the makeup for the, for the next however long until you know if you have got it or not. But yeah, my audition story was, was quite wild. So yeah. Not the okay, most well, standard of audition processes. Let's, well, let's hear it. Let's hear it. So I first auditioned for the show for the international tour in March of my third year at college. It was one of like my first auditions at college and obviously already had so much pressure on it because it was cats. But it was for the role of Demeter, which I'm okay. a little I'm a little young for. I would love to go back to the show and cover her. But I think at the time, obviously, I was like, cats. <laughs> So I went to the audition and yeah, it went well. And I got to meet Chrissy for the first time and her lovely daughter, Emily Langham took our call, which was amazing. And it was just like a, a dream come true with an hour. And obviously you learn the ball as the first round for most auditions. So it was an amazing process and I was so happy that I did it. And I'd started my catch journey and I had very much said to my agent from, from even the letter that I wrote to him asking for representation, it, ha it had cats in it. I was like, I need someone to get me into yeah. cats, Mary Poppins, Coruscant and Legally Blonde. That's it. And then I'm all right. <laughs> so, yeah, and it was fabulous to go and obviously learn the ball properly from those two amazing women. And then I had an audition for the for the ship, for Jemima, which was a bit closer to I, I, Jemima, gorgeous. Like, what a beautiful, yeah, yeah. beautiful character. So that was exciting but i that was self-tapes and they're quite hard oh, okay. songs to to get across on a self-tape they're very very high very soprano so that was my um second run in with the show and then i my self-tape was for asia tour as well i had a tape for that rather than it be an audition it was very random it was very very quick and i actually was supposed to do another job unfortunately cats came through my yes came through at the same time um so i chose cats of course but um, yeah. yeah it was quite it was a hectic week that week it went sort of from nothing to everything in one week and it was so strange I had to self-tape the whole song because I didn't obviously have a mungo with me so I had to sing the mungo bits in too which is was so silly and so fun and my parents like I recorded it at home and they were laughing at me because it was just so funny I'm northern so to be putting on a cockney accent and singing these two parts of such a speedy song it was I imagine it was much funnier for them to listen to than it was for me to do. But myself and my dad watched a few videos before we recorded it. And the video that we watched the most is actually of, he then became my Mungo Jerry, Billy Mahoney, and his partner mm. before Neve, who did the film. And 
I really had modelled it off of accidentally, I guess, Billy, the Mungo lines that I was singing. So then to see the cast announcement and it be his face was just crazy. It was meant to be. That's so funny. So you were doing both. I'm like imagining you. I mean, you're obviously not doing the dance parts on the self tape, probably, right? I or mean, are you? If you if once you meet me in real life one day, you will realize I absolutely did the dance parts too. <laughs> uh, so I mean, I, I just am envisioning like, are you doing the I, the the cartwheels like by yourself? Just <laughs> so one ver just one half was, of it. It was just a minute and a half long, which actually made it harder because the first minute, obviously, you're familiar with the duet. It's is very Mungo heavy. So, yeah. Yeah. Which was it was it was so fun, and they wanted it back very quickly. So I just sort of took this afternoon to do that, and then the next day took the afternoon again to do like the ensemble stuff. And I remember we got to rehearsals, and the very few of us that were new to the cast, like new to cast completely, we were talking about our self tapes, and we said like, "Oh gosh, if some of those like alto harmony lines of the end of the show were ever leaked, oh, they're just so funny because <laughs> you don't know." what you're recording because you've not done the show before you're just sent this sheet music and you're like okay here we go <laughs> yeah you're like not prepared for it and also have been preparing your whole life for exactly. it so it's it's kind of this weird middle and you're doing it quickly yeah. i was ready um, for the got... rump part just not yeah, the, the yeah. Outro line. <laughs> yeah i it's it is a fascinating like i do think like obviously the pandemic changed like the way a lot of a lot of um industries work and function and I, like your industry's shift of that is fascinating to me of you go from going always in with like a call, like a big open call with lots of people to this, like being in a room by yourself and doing yeah. this in isolation on a video to then send to somebody. It's got to be a very different process yeah. than what I you mean, did in person. The, I've just finished the Adams family here in London. And that is the first job that I've ever got from an in-person call and I, I'm wow. young I'm at the start of my career but that was a huge moment for me because it made me really think about the fact that uh, so much of our lives because of lockdown was so reliant on self-tape and I'm so I'm so grateful for everything and the extra training that I actually got out of that time but I'm so glad that my my journey took that course but it's definitely shifted the way things were definitely in my first year of graduation like between graduating and going to cats a lot of taping a lot of online things yeah i mean it's it's allowed some stuff like like this is easier you know we're you know, i live in new york you live in london we can do this and <laughs> the technology is now built to make it a lot easier so there's yeah. been some some interesting switch sw up in terms of this i want to um i want to now fast forward to exactly the part you mentioned which is you you're the you get there with a bunch of other people who had not done cats before but also people who have Walk me through, I'm always fascinated by what you're told. So this is obviously going like, this isn't a small regional production where it's going on for like six or eight weeks. This is a tour that's going to go on for over a year. So you're given backstory and probably your felinity school and all of the different pieces that come with this. So what do you remember, especially of that process, but especially the, here's what I was specifically told that I need to play for Mungo Jerry and Rebel Teaser. Like this is their personality, this is their story. So we got to rehearsals and the first two days, we were very lucky. They'd flown, I think there were six of us that were new to the cast. Definitely, it wasn't a lot. It was a very small portion of our cast was, was new. So they flew us out two days before everybody else and we learned the opening and the ball. And we got to do a lot of like cat school with our lovely resident director, Matt Kazan, and also our lovely Tommy, who was putting on the show for Chrissy because she came towards the end of our process. Um, but yeah, that was so helpful because we had two days before the others came in, which sort of helped to get past. It was a very safe space because we were all new. And then the difference between like watching us because obviously the first thing you do is like, it's literally day one, hour one, on the floor, crawl around like a cat, probably before you even know who your character is really, that that's the basics to build upon. And then when everyone else gets in the room, that helps the characterization. Chrissy gives you your three words, which I'm sure you've mm -hmm. heard about. And they're like this blessing to you that really help with the characterization. But the difference in the like six of us newbies and then versus three days later when everyone else got in the room and you're looking at these people and, I so distinctly remember looking at our Jemima, Gabby, who had also been a white cat. And I was like, this girl is amazing. Like she is a cat. 
I just yeah. looked at her, sat there, and I thought, oh, my gosh, I've got work to do. Like, it's, but it was so inspiring as well to have those people that had done it so many times. And, yeah, and they were so helpful. I mean, my gorgeous Billy, my Mungo, had done the show, I think, six times before this one, and he was so helpful. And he was just the best as well at inspiring me to create my own version of Rump because, you know, it's hard. I mean, I am besotted with Bonnie Langford. The, the fact that she was the first, the first girl to do this and Mm -hmm. I love everything that she's done since so it's hard to then separate and be like no like Katie you are the Bonnie now you get to make those choices that she did once upon a time and that's it's hard and at 21 the imposter syndrome for the first couple of weeks or months was really real because yeah I thought that she was my dream role I thought she was going to take me a longer time to get to than she did and obviously I was so lucky for that but it was hard to to separate scared like just graduated Katie from the the fact that I actually had the ability to like make my choices and make her my own and that was really celebrated especially by I'm very close with Matt Kazan who was our resident and he he was an absolute joy with with helping me with that he was amazing and yeah and my rumple is she obviously she's naughty she's effervescent she's impressionable because they're my three words but I really I think she ended up very, very impressionable just by the wonderful people that surrounded me and, and people that I've looked up to for a long time. And also, I think she's maybe a bit less tomboy and like more girly than other people's rumples because that's who I am. And I think you can you could really look at our cast, which is what I think makes Cats so special, is you could look at our cast and point out any single one of us and know exactly who our cat was because <laughs> we just were them. Like, it. I mean, my best friend from tour, Taryn, who we just had the best bond. She was Cassandra. And my gosh, like, she's Cassandra. Like, obviously, Cass got to do Vogue on our tour because she just is her. She's, it's, it's crazy to look around the room and see these, these caricatures. And I think the casting team of Cats and Chrissy herself is just fantastic at knowing who's going to be able to bring themselves to that role and, and just make something that's so wild when you talk about it so real. Yeah. It's it's interesting because it's always the do they cast so perfectly because they know that you are like your own personality is embodying it embodying that cat or is it as you're you know, you're all professional actors and performers that are paid to do this and you just are so good at it and you do it so many times that you start to become part of that character. Oh, most so I've always definitely. wondered which comes first. There's probably a little bit of both in reality. I think. For for a show like Cats, everybody, would, lots of people would love to do it. They have like the such a gorgeous pool of people to choose from to be able to do that show because it's so iconic. So I think, I think in my case, it definitely starts with there's no wonder that Demeter didn't come first and Jemima didn't come first in my Cats journey because everything that I am as a person, I'm so rump. Like I remember our yeah. our first day off that we had as a cast, there were six of us and we went to explore this like art village in Seoul. And I just, I've grown up with, with parents. It might sound awful. Like we might have to, might have to edit, but um, they, they, um, you know, if you go to a restaurant and there's like a tiny spoon with a logo on it and it's straight in the handbag, that's my mum all over it. Always has been maybe awful, but that, that's her. And then we went to this art shop, arts and crafts shop, and they had this leopard print ribbon. And I didn't think anything of it. I just like cut a bit off and put it in my hair. And we got outside of this shop. And one of the boys in my cast goes, Katie, where did that ribbon come from? And I was like, oh, I just loved it. I just loved it. <laughs> and from that day, we just had this, oh my gosh, Katie's a thief. She is Rumpel Teaser. Like you've take, taken it too far. Like <laughs> you've in the character. And I used to wear this ribbon to rehearsals to like, just that little bit of naughty Rem- remind yourself from yeah. week one and that it was just something to laugh about then for the <laughs> for the next part of the contract because obviously so early we were all getting to know each other and yeah oh, it was funny. that's I so still fun have it. <laughs> that's so fun yeah i think that's a, a cool part of the show is there is the you know they they have to find some of that personality but there's also the ability to to take on some of those and you start to you know you do this eight times a week and mm. more and and you're you're really kind of embracing the character and also, if you're lucky enough to get to do it with i actually did it with all of my gorgeous mungo covers i obviously did it most with billy but yeah. i got to do it with my dance captain who was our first cover and i got to do it with my really good friend who was our second cover and i think then that changes her as well because 
all of a sudden sometimes if you're on with somebody who hasn't done it as often she becomes the leader a little bit whereas like I think in our dynamic Mungo is more the leader but he'd sort of shove her first make sure yeah. she got caught first but I think yeah and it definitely changed as we were on tour for a long time and we had a lot of eight show weeks but we also had a lot of five show weekends and then days mm. off in between and that gave us time to really like what I really appreciated about the creative team that we had with us on the tour our dance captain and our resident who were with us they weren't afraid to give us notes and I love that I love that as the show went along they cared so much to keep it at its absolute best and individually like I had quite a battle for for some time a couple of months when we finished our soul season over whether I wanted to make her a little bit more tomboy and like challenge myself to do that because that's not as natural for me and I think that helped me find different things within her so yeah it's always it's such a journey and I'd love to do it again and see what she's like when I'm a little bit older because I always yeah. thought that's when I would do it so yeah I think that would be really interesting we're gonna take a quick break and then we'll be back for more of the wrong cat died I want to transition to some of the relationships. So there's obviously the relationship with Mungo Jerry, and you mentioned Billy. But I was introduced to you by Harry Francis, who also played Mungo Jerry, but also played Mr. Mistopheles a couple of times. So um, what are other relationships that you as Rumple Teaser notice with the other cats that either were told to you, hey, I've got to play this, like these, I mean, Mungo's the obvious one, or that you just kind of picked up along the way because of either friendships or staging or storylines but what were some of those that you remember i've got i think three that are like really important for me to talk about my first one i have to mention her first because if she listens she will need me to up <laughs> so um, my taryn who played our cassandra was my my best friend on tour and i still she's australian and i still speak to her every single day she yeah someone the universe really put her in my life for a reason she's amazing but that made rumple teaser and cassandra i can't imagine a friend on every on every version of cats because their cats don't naturally come together but me yeah rumple and cassandra definitely had a bond on our version and she got on for bomb ballerina a few quite a lot actually at the end of our run in taipei which then meant rumple and bomb had to got a little bit a bit of a bond as well and that definitely made her naughtier being friends with bomb um mm. cassandra just used to like to tell her off really and then um, yeah if she was being extra naughty Cass would definitely have something to say about it so that was a nice relationship and that definitely came from mine and taryn's relationship and then something that did the opposite to that was i wasn't that close with our jenny any dots at the start of tour and then rumple and mungo the kittens are sort of encouraged to go towards your jennies your skimbles to especially when grizz comes in to like hide with them and to have them look after them so i spent a lot of time with my auntie maddie who was our jenny any dots on stage which then gave us this beautiful bond off stage too so that was mm. really nice now that i've mentioned him he wasn't one of my three but skimble shanks as well gavin was my teacher actually at, um, at college and within my training. So we we already had a special bond, but the like sort of teacher student dynamic and then the Skimble Shanks and Rumpel dynamic was so much fun. And I love, I love working with Gavin. He, yeah, he's amazing. There's nobody who's more in their character on stage than Gavin is. And yeah, I felt wow. really, really privileged to work with him after learning a lot from him and then learning just so much more from him on the job. And then obviously, so you mentioned Harry, I also had a really good bond with my mistos on tour too, um, who so it started with Xavier and then our cover Kian, he got on quite a lot and I was really close with them both. So I sort of had this thing in my head, especially during my time and my friendship as well with Harry, that Rumpel definitely had a thing for Misto. I, <laughs> that was, she loved that Misto solo. And also because my, my gorgeous friends that were doing it in daily in the show it was just so much fun to watch them and i also it's a part of the show where thank goodness we're not doing too much and nobody's watching mungo and rump because i just you know you watch that and you're like it's amazing the first time we saw our misto do it in rehearsals i just remember being just completely blown away because you're like eight times a week eight, and i'm sure yeah. people watch the cartwheels and the duet and think that but for me that was the moment I sat there and watched Xavier do it for the first time, I was like, wow, like we're doing cats. Like he's going to do that eight times a week. And just such a fangirl moment. And obviously I, yeah, massively admire all the mistos, but I'm very fortunate. I think Harry's misto solo is 
epic just one of one of the greatest out there and also Xavier is just sublime he's completely sublime and Kian who got to do it all the time Kian and the Korean fans their bond with Kian was just out of this world I've never seen anything like it they loved him and he loved them and yeah it was special special to watch Misto's a great yeah just great character That's I mean so he wouldn't fun. have a thing for the Misto definitely Ramsey yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's magic yeah. did, did you ever have um like feedback to you especially like with with Cass of like hey you guys got to tone it back a little bit. Like these two aren't supposed to be close. Like it's, you know, or is it just something that's like, it's, it's not really noticeable for the the average person watching, but it's kind of a fun little thing for you too. I think Taz and I got away with it because our, our personalities, as I said earlier, are very similar to our characters. Like she, so her and her cast face, it's enough to, to put off anyone. Rump would be definitely scared of her and so would Katie. So on stage, like we, our friendship was so obvious, but we definitely also stayed in our characters. The only time we as a cast had, um, had words with was there's some very hilarious musical accents at the start of Misto. And obviously, if you're familiar with the show, a lot of listeners will be. It's very dark on stage at that point, but it's not maybe as dark as we thought. And yeah, I, Paul Tugger is giving it life in that solo. And we just used to get, I mean, by the end of the nine show week, he wasn't getting carried away. But I think that was the only time we were pretty good. If we were going to do something, we made sure it stayed in our characters. Yeah. I mean, okay. definitely. Because especially I could get away with murder. She's the naughty one. Yeah. So <laughs> me and Billy were always fine. <laughs> Yeah, you could do whatever you want. I mean, that's the the point of your of of your character. Um, I do want to hear a little bit before we go to the rapid fire about. I know that you mentioned that your your cast was in Vogue in Korea. So, how did that come to life? What was that experience like? And I mean, that's a very very cool uh, perk and and yeah. uh, experience. And one that you just would never put with with doing a, a tour of cats. I don't think I would have ever in my wildest dreams put that with being in Vogue magazine. But in fact, it, it's just crazy because as like, I'm a short girl, I'm perfect rumple height, being a model in Vogue, that has never been on yeah. my radar. <laughs> and so, you know, our, our um, company manager, he comes up to a few of us and he's like, can you keep next Thursday daytime free? And we're like, okay, thinking maybe we'll have to come in early, sign some programs. Like, and it was the usual sort of Mungo Rump, Monk Strap, Misto, like the people. So we were like, oh, this is okay. We'll keep the day free. And then it gets the first day and we're all in really early doing our makeup completely perfectly because we've been given this heads up that it's like a photo shoot Vogue here and we're freaking out. I mean, Cassandra Tarrin, that's it's always been on her bucket list to, to be a model in Vogue. So I'm sat with her in the dressing room with this free Starbucks coffee like we were just spoiled the whole day. <laughs> and um, And then we had to walk, we all had to walk outside the theatre to get to where we were doing the photo shoot, which entirely illegal, cats with humans. So even that was just so much fun, just the whole day from start to finish. And all our wiggies were with us and all our, just everyone together, it was so lovely. So we walked over to the building where we were shooting the pictures and they had like this backdrop set up. And um, obviously it was a fashion shoot, but we were involved and we were musical theatre performers. So they started with me and Billy, which was like our worst nightmares. They started with us and um, they were like, be cats, but, but be a bit Instagram. But like you are in Vogue, but obviously stay in your characters. And me and Billy are like, oh my gosh. So there's, there's these series of three photos that are printed, double page spread in Vogue magazine. And it is genuinely just us looking at each other as our, my friendship with Billy, like completely captured in essence in Vogue magazine, because we were we were just baffled. We were like, okay, so we're, we're doing this. Like there's actually a camera in front of us. And yeah, it was brilliant. And then my absolute favorite part of the day that I have to tell the story. And we were, we sort of had this backdrop and it was quite slippy and we're in these jazz shoes. And we had to like run in and meet each other on the backdrop. And Billy just, he went for it and he slipped and the Vogue, the backdrop ripped. So it's like my claim to fame forever that Munger and Rump ripped the Vogue background. Like they had to like re-roll this backdrop out because we'd ripped it. And we were, oh gosh, we're so embarrassed. But no wonder the pictures are so no, that's, 
so perfectly accurate. in character. Yes. That is perfectly in character. If anybody's going to wreck the set, it's going to be Mungo Jerry and Rumpel oh Teaser. Oh my gosh, yeah, exactly. And the model that we did it with, she was just a genuine Korean model. That was her like full-time job. And she was just so lovely. And she was just asking us all questions about what we did. And we were asking her. And it was just an, an insight into a completely different world, a completely different life. And we, Vogue, really took control of the shoot. So it was just nice to have like bit of direction that was like a little bit contradictory to our normal characters. It was just such an interesting day and we all we all loved it. And we were all exhausted by the time we did the show in the evening because you think it's not going to be that challenging, but actually like to get oh, the, the right yeah. picture. It was I mean, mine and Billy's heads were so close to this girl's face in the the like front page picture that's like at the, the front of the section of the magazine that we had got like orange makeup on her Gucci dress and we were freaking but they were <laughs> loving it they wanted us as close as possible it was just so different to anything I've ever done before and yeah it's definitely one of my my favorite things about the contract it. we'll try to include uh these pictures in, on social media with with the episode <laughs> so they'll, they'll they'll be in uh I, I just the whole idea of that day is fascinating to me because it's already you know, you're in a show that's hard to explain. Like, it's hard to explain to probably people who aren't in or even know theater. It's like, my job is to dress up as a cat and dance for two and a half hours, yeah. eight times a week. But then you get dressed, you're walking through the streets in full, probably makeup, costume, everything. Then you get there, and I just am envisioning, I've not done photo shoots and, you know, like, but the whole the whole joke is always that it's an improv class essentially. So they're getting all the different things. And there's always a joke of like, be a cat. And it's like, no, that's actually what they're telling yeah. you to do. And so you're getting this whole different experience, but then you still have to go back to work and that night do the show. Yeah, it was wild. It was absolutely what a day. wild. And we were like on such a high from it as well. It was, it was just epic. And I tell people now, I'm like, I'm in Vogue. And they're like, Katie, shut up. I'm like, no, no, I promise you. I promise you. It's just, the, yeah it's the coolest thing ever i made my agent put it on my like performing cv because i'm like it'll just catch eyes it's so random yeah. um but yeah it was it was strange like the whole you're at a photo shoot but also be a cat because i also think until we got in the room with the model they didn't necessarily know what they wanted and we didn't know what we wanted out of it either it was very collaborative it was lovely and one of the biggest takeaways that we all took we were so proud of ourselves and our makeup because all of these professional makeup artists were like wow you did it yourself you do your own yeah. makeup and we were like yeah we do every day <laughs> every day yeah yeah you, you become experts at that that is such a cool experience and such a fun fun piece um let's go to rapid fire i want to do some quick rapid fire questions before we get to the you know the key question here <laughs> um so if you could go on for one night any cat Male, female, doesn't matter. Just, I would love to just perform for one night as this character. Who would you want to go on as? Absolutely, Misto. Misto. Do it, love it. Definitely, Misto. Yep. Love it. Who are your favorite and least favorite characters? Oh, gosh. Oh, that's hard. Okay. Characters, I'm going to separate them from like my people on tour and everything. Yes, characters. completely. My favorite character is Victoria. Definitely. Victoria. I wrote my second year essay on Victoria and her role in Cats. I just, I'm fascinated by that whole concept. I think there's, yeah, there's more more to her than we will ever know and understand. And her story and her journey is just amazing. And and the white cat touch. I mean, everybody sobbed when that first happened in the rehearsal room. Yeah. She's definitely my favorite. Least favorite. Ooh, my least favorite character in our version was the Siamese because you just can't see anything. But that's not really a character. That was just my yeah. least favorite blinding moment. Um. Favorite? That's really hard because they're all so wonderful. I guess Rumpel's least favorite. Oh no, I don't think it is. I was going to say McCavity, but I kind of loved him. I kind of yeah. wanted to run away in his gang. So, oh, that's you've you've really stumped me. My my. Oh, I don't think I have one. I don't think I have a least favorite. I can't think of a reason for them to be my least. So let me reframe it then. Who's the one? Because I, I look at this as a family. Yeah. Who's the family member that's like, ah, en enough. I, you know, oh, okay. it's, it's been like, I still love them, but enough. Okay. Gus, definitely. Gus. Oh. Mungo and Rump sat on the oven for the whole of Gus. They want to leave. She definitely wants to leave. Oh, no, no this is bad, is bad for my last Mungo's question. Mungo's got more willpower. <laughs> bad for my last I question. Love okay. Gus, but I'm definitely bored by him. Favorite song in the show? Favorite song? 
my good Jerry and Rumpel teaser, always, because you sing the first line and you're like, I can't believe this is my life every day. Yeah, I love it. Um, okay, my fun one. I always like to ask the fun one and I try to create it to something related to, to our episode. So which cat do you think would be the best Vogue model if they were doing that professionally? He, our version of this cat didn't get to do the shoot and I was just heartbroken. Alonso, our Alonso, mm. the model cat, let me tell you, like beautiful, just legs for days, the perfect makeup every day. Definitely Alonso. And I think that about a lot of Alonzos generally, they're just so gorgeous. Yeah. Alonso and cat, they own it. Yeah, I was thinking Bomb Ballerina probably would own it too. Of course, definitely. Yeah, okay, great. Um, most important question and final question is this this whole show is centered around the fact that i don't think grizabella is the right jellical choice so i want to hear who are you katie if you're voting if you're okay. picking who are you picking and why if katie as a level english student who wrote an essay on this show is choosing most definitely grizabella because i love the idea that she sent up and eventually we're going to have a jemima step up to be a female leader of the tribe and take it over in a very different way because she's so inspired by grizabella so therefore that has to happen and she has to be sent up in order for that journey in my mind would happen okay wait I want, so your version is grizabella goes mm -hmm. and then jemima is inspired by her redemption story and Most takes definitely. over from old deuteronomy yeah i think she's so curious from the very very beginning jemima's even her entrance her first line and those big eyes i think as an audience member i definitely she's the one that i look at and i'm like there's something there's something gonna happen there there's power in her and i think the tribe doesn't know her power and especially in our production wherever we were depended on what language jemima sang moonlight which was so special and watching the audience reaction to that everyone's rooting for her everyone is rooting for her but i think the older members and the male members of the tribe they don't quite know that she's got secret power wow so jemima doesn't exist in the versions that i've seen because it's not okay jemima doesn't exist or i think it was renamed but jemima is not um was loosely canceled as a character in the u.s and so the uh, the version with andy blinkenbuehler's choreography i never got that so this take is very different i've never thought about this angle which is that she's ready. So essentially, how does Old Deuteronomy go away in this scenario? Because I've always thought when Old Deuteronomy's time is over, Monkus Trap is taking over, right? Like he's the next, yeah. the son and next in line. How is Jemima taking over power? I love this idea. See, in at, within our cast, our Jemima had a really close bond with our Old Deuteronomy as well. Like there was a lot of scenes where they were sat together. So I think in within my own little world and story he can see the power in her too and i think that's why he when she sings moonlight there's such a everyone else is staring outwards and old deuteronomy he doesn't obviously he's not the instinct for her to start singing it's within the moon it's within what she's just seen and she doesn't think it's okay but i think that he he's the first to acknowledge that and notice that and then obviously in the end of the show he pushes the white cat forward to do the touch but I do think there's a lot to be said and a lot of power within. Do, in America, does your syllabub and your Vicky, do they split track if, if there aren't enough people performing? Because in the UK, that's what happens. And Jemima ends up being the white cat. The white cat sings Jemima's bits and it's beautiful. Hmm. So that I don't know. I, I'm sure somebody can reply to this. So there's some some fans who know every, every inch of the show <laughs> and will know that. I just don't know the dancing and the different like staging well enough because I've always yeah. seen it a handful of times. So there's more of the lore. a version where if the females are in such a cut situation where you'd have a Vicky and Jemima split track where the solo and everything would be done as Vicky, but she also takes on the lines yeah. and the sort of role of, of singing with Grizz and, and being that person. And I just think those two cats, they've, they fascinated me ever since second year, the white cat touch everything about like, the lift, just how much there is in that choreography. And I am, I am gutted. She's the biggest loss in my, in my cat's journey is that Gillian Lynn obviously passed away before I got to do the show because I, I would love to just sit in and pick her brains. So I think mm -hmm. if I could be at a dinner party with anyone, she'd be on my, she'd be massively high up on my list because it's just beautiful. The choreography linking in is just so beautiful. Those three make sense though. When I think about it, because one theory that I was told by a Victoria that I love 
is that she was last year's choice and this is her being reborn. That's why she, you're getting the beginning of her oh, new journey. I love that. And so then if you have that partnered with Jemima as ready to take over and that, and then with old Deuteronomy, like those three are kind of the duo. It's like last year's choice. And then the next, these are almost like king and queen. Like these are the two yeah. rulers together. And it's like when the king's reign is over, the queen's taking over. Yeah. Um, I, I love that. I've not thought about that or even heard that in any capacity. And so I normally try to argue against every Grizabella choice, but I might accept this one purely because you're bringing me to a new theory I've not thought about yeah. at all. Definitely. Well, that's what this is for, you see. But that's definitely Katie's theory. I don't think Rump would have thought thought quite that that extensively yet. Who does, being the, yeah, as I say, who does Rump want to have go up or oh, does she, she even care? she definitely wants it to be Gus. Like one more, one more Growl Tiger story, one more year of Growl Tiger, and she's going to be sending herself up to the heavy side yeah. there. Definitely so she, Gus. So she's picking Gus not because she thinks he deserves it. It's because she's so tired of listening to these stories. <laughs> it's like, it's time. We got to get rid of this he guy. He doesn't want to put that Siamese mask on one more time, let me tell you. No, <laughs> I, would, I would definitely still put it back on. But no, I also think it naturally within our cast like we've listened to your podcast we've heard the the questions and i i ended up really great friends with the us tour rumple who's also called taryn and we've spoken yeah. about this and i gus definitely definitely does deserve it more 100 percent. but the story of redemption with gris is so special but i do think there's a lot to be said of the story of redemption would be beautiful if it was gus too if it was written that way i think yeah, definitely. And our our lovely Ian John Borg, who was just the most phenomenal actor every single night, he'd make you nearly cry. Like, I can't imagine yeah. being in the audience watching him because I was nearly at that point watching him on stage every night. And yeah, his character definitely deserves to go up. It, I mean, yeah, I love it. So you said that your cast, that you listened to this show, like as you were oh, doing definitely. it while we had you were rehearsing? Our, our lovely Ed Wade came on and did yeah. I don't know when he recorded the episode, but it came out while we were we were still away. <laughs> so we had to listen to Ed in the dressing room. <laughs> I, I that Ed was so fun. Um, and his presentation yeah. of Cats too. He he used to tell us all the time we had to like sit him down and, and become an audience with snacks between a double show day and like hear this. And I reckon our versions of the characters then in the evening show, having heard what happened to them, were definitely affected. I Ed's cats too. <laughs> I remember when we were recording, he's like, I've got, you know, a little I, I've I've thought about this and I did it. And he started telling me about it. And then he told the whole thing. I'm like, this is it deep. Did he like this is thought out. No, we didn't do any of the songs on there, but he's um he told me about them. I mean, I, I'm floored, floored by it. I was floored by it to the point where I was like, I want to, we got to make this happen. I've written like four different versions of Cats too, but I can't write songs and I can't do this. I just have the, yeah, how do we take the different versions of this next year or after? I love the, I like the idea of a ghost of Catsmas Pass is what I've called it, which is Grizabella comes back and learns that her, like what would be her, her being the choice, like how that impacted the rest of the tribe. Yeah. And you get that kind of, you know, story. Yeah, that would be really cool. Do you know what's the funniest part about this question as well, that I find the funniest and that I really kept trying to bring myself back to if I felt like I was like, obviously there's so much to be explored and to be serious about, but the fact that Mungo and Rumpel do that duet actually thinking that they have a chance, bless yeah. their hearts bless their hearts also why do they want to go up and it used to make me it used to make me laugh when we'd first sing old deuteronomy i'd sit on the um car boot with billy as mungo and rump fully in it after that duet and we'd be like oh you wanted to be us please yeah when speak it just made me laugh i it is a fascinating full-on concept of like how does the criteria get made how is this picked yeah. why is everybody like there are clearly some people like Tugger doesn't really want to go, but he's also putting his he name in the loves ring. The like, attention. yeah. So there's kind of that, like, are they actually wanting to go? Is there actually thought there? Do Mungo and Rump kind of like, oh, I kind of want to go, and are just we so just naive to, to realize they shouldn't? And yeah. And I just want to put my my pearls on. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, exactly. Uh, well, this has been fun. I love always. Anytime I get a brand new theory, I love it. So I <laughs> love hearing a theory that I had not heard. I'm sure other people have heard it. Maybe not. This is. I think the beauty of this podcast is the super fans are are deep. So there are times where stuff I've made up, they're like, that's true. And there are times where they're like, oh, I've heard this, but here's why I don't want this. And I, I love it. I think that's the beauty of the show. 
is that there isn't all like there's a lot of open area of interpretation which I allows for these conversations give, speaking of fans of the show i have to give the hugest shout out to we had these two gorgeous us fans and they came to watch the show and they'd messaged us and stuff before and they were sat on the right on the front row in in the ball at the end of act one and i i love a bit of audience interaction especially on those days where as much as everybody loves the show you have those days where you just need a little bit extra to to get you to the yeah. end of that ball and i spotted both of them i think like right towards the end of hovers and i just couldn't drop eye contact with them because their faces everything it was just i'll never forget it i'll never ever forget that it was a special moment actually and then we met after stage door and it just it blows my mind now that i'm able to like be the person walking out of that door and meeting those people because mm -hmm. for so long that was the other way around and i i still do that now with i'm the biggest fan girl of all of my my now friends and yeah it was just really really special so i have to have to give that to them and they they inspired me for that for that extra ending of the soul season most definitely they were wonderful we're really amazing lucky. yeah there's there's such a, an incredible fan base mm. um how can people stay in touch with you on social media and keep up with everything you're up to? I love my Instagram. I'm always on my Instagram, and that is just at Katie Hutton. Just my name. No numbers, no nothing. Just my name. And I pop everything on there as soon as I know that I'm doing something exciting, which will hopefully not be too long again before that happens. Everything's on there. And, yeah, lots of cat stuff on there. I've kept all of my stories and my highlights up from the tour and also my new journey that I've just embarked on with the Adams family is all on there too and I think fans of Cats would love that show as well because it's very mm -hmm. similar with the makeup and the commitment to your role and every everyone in our ensemble had their own separate character which was really special and very similar to Cats so yeah just my Instagram really that's me all right well we will link it we will hopefully get the Vogue pictures to share too and uh, include everything when this comes out. So thank you so much for hopping on and uh, sharing some really fun stories and some some new thoughts or some at least new, new thoughts for me, which is always amazing. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me. And it's just been a joy to return to the, the happiness and the excitement that yeah. Rumpel gave me. She's a gift. I love it. Well, thank you. And thanks everyone else for listening to this episode of The Wrong Cat Died, the podcast breakdown of the cast catastrophe. To follow along, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any of listen to podcasts. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and threads at The Wrong Cat Died, or check out our website, theroncatdied.com. Bye.